this is our agenda for today. So we'll go through these. We're gonna talk about tier zero, which is typically all flash, right? Everybody loves flash, really fast, really cool, but also very expensive. So you're not gonna use it to store everything, especially when you start talking about zettabytes, exabytes, even pibs, it gets very, very pricey. There's tier two. We call this the warm tier, right? We're still gonna run active workloads. We wanna mitigate latency. We wanna keep the data close to our data sets. How many people here are familiar with Hadoop? Okay, so you guys understand the premise behind Hadoop early on, right? We move the jobs to where the data lives. Why? Because, well, back then it wasn't fast. Networks have increased. The ability to transmit data has gotten faster but we still want to have some type of data locality close to the compute and the processing. And then there's my favorite, tier N. This is where we focus. Why do we focus there? Roughly 80% of an enterprise is going to keep their data in tier N. Whether it's cold tape, whether it's just cheap spinning rust, whether it's on file coin, that's where we want to live today. As the network evolves, there will be more opportunity, but today, tier N is really where we want to focus. So as we start looking at our use case heat map here, we see scientific archive, we have public archive, we have analytics archive or, or data lake. We'll talk about all of the other data sets we've mentioned already, so I won't keep you uh, stuck on that slide. But why are we bullish on these? And I think you guys have heard today about all this data being generated, right? But one of the things that's great about this solution, and uh, myself and Aaron Gibson, we worked at a, another vendor that preached the anti-ransomware, the immutability concept, right? I swear to God, their, their, their marketing campaign was ransomware. Nobody could really talk to it. Nobody really understood it. But that idea of immutable storage is so important. We get it natively. There is no escalation charge. There's no fancy API calls. It just shows up, it stays, it's protected. Verifiable content is essential. That is the premise of this network. That is why we are here. Users want to store their data and trust that it hasn't been manipulated, modified, encrypted, adjusted. Geographic distribution is another one, right? We just kind of talked loosely about Hadoop. The ability to have data at specific localities, whether it's for uh, I don't know, uh, political restriction, whether it's to keep the compute close, all of those things are important. You have the opportunity now to fill in gaps in storage that most can't. Let's face it, if, if Amazon or Google wanted to spin up a data center, could they? Yes. Would they do it just about anywhere? No. But we have over 3,800 providers globally that can provide some type of geographically specific accessibility to data. That is very important. And one of the cool parts about this network, as people come to store data, they may say, I want a copy in the US. I want a copy in Europe. I want a copy in Asia. Be that copy. There is so much opportunity in this space. Cost is another big one, right? When we weigh these factors, the ability to store data so cheaply and preserve it for such a long period of time is a dream for a lot of folks that have to deal with data persistence. The idea that I could put it on Microsoft OneDrive and it's, it's <laughs> backed up for 30 days, right? Day 31, someone deletes a file, you're not gonna get it back. That data persistence is a problem for folks. Managing that cost is a problem. Scalability is another one, right? So this isn't just about maybe giving somebody cheap capacity. It's about being able to satisfy some of these use cases. DirecTV's backdoor archive where they were keeping a lot of their cloud DVR recordings, at one point was over two exabytes in size. And uh, when at t bought it, they said, let's move everything to Ceph. For those of you that are familiar with Ceph, I won't tell you how that experiment went. <laughs> Life sciences genomics, this is a big one. This is becoming more and more prevalent. I mean, now we're sequencing everything. Did you know that on the Filecoin network we have the 3,000 rice genomes sequenced? I didn't think people cared that much about rice, but they do, and it's stored, and it persists. Genomic sequencing, sequencing is expensive. That is a process by which you only want to do it once. An Illumina sequencer, I won't tell you the cost because it would probably upset you, but um, having to run that, capture that data, ensure that data persists and is accessible, it's very, very, very important. You don't want to have to execute it more than once. 
there's the idea of data persistence. So how many here has have how many of you here have had x-rays? I'm assuming everybody has, right? The Virginia College of Radiology has a very interesting retention policy. If you have a child get an x-ray, that x-ray has to persist seven years past that child's 18th birthday. My son didn't have his helmet on, crash landed, fractured his skull at age one. That means that x-ray has to live for 24 years before it can officially be retired. So understand when we start talking about these use cases, this isn't just about the volumes of data, it's about the data persistence and the sheer volumes that get generated are insane. Right? So we have to scale to meet the demands of growth. I was working with a genomic sequencing company. They were deleting 140 terabytes a month. Why? Because they didn't have the budget to keep buying Isilon. So they would just dump the old samples. Those old samples have value, right? And we don't realize it until it's too late. Warren, you've worked in oil and gas, right? How important is seismic data? It's their lifeblood. That's right, there are companies that actually maintain seismic data going all the way back to the 70s on magnetic media. I know, very exciting, right? The reason that they do this is simple. As new algorithms come up for, for detection, they actually will run it on these legacy data sets to see if there are any anomalies. Same thing is done in genomics and life sciences. This is why data persistence is so very important. To give you an idea of what type of scale we're talking, uh, for the last 13 years, I have called the Atlanta area home. I'm now moving to Florida for those of you that are interested. But at this point, to sequence every resident of Atlanta, you'd re require roughly 50 petabytes to store those, those sequenced data sets. Now that's before we get into things like anomaly detection, VCF generation, all that stuff, right? You, you might be sitting here saying, mm, that's not bad. Well, New York City, now we're closing in on an exabyte just to do the city. Now apply that at global scale. When we start talking about data of this volume, it is very significant. And it is very important to understand that we as a network have the ability to deliver this capacity. And that has to be part of the messaging that you share with your customers, right? You guys can go out and spend $1,000 a terabyte on Isilon and put it on-prem, but good luck building at the volume that, that the network can grow. It's very important. We're, we're talking to providers now that are talking about putting on 100 200, 600 petabytes of capacity just to meet the demands of data growth. This one is another one of my favorites. And, and this is a common problem that you see in municipalities. How many people follow ransomware attacks in this room? I can't tell you the number of times I've seen City X had their data encrypted. As a resident of Atlanta, it was a, it was a $21 million mistake for a city of 500,000 people. So when we start talking about public archives and having that immutable storage, they want to encrypt it, they want to shard it before they store it, that's fine. But once it's on, it's protected. By the way, five to six copies protected. Six copies of data durability, what is that, Aaron? 22 nines, roughly? 25 nines? And two copies is roughly nine, maybe 11 nines of data durability, but you're start now talking about being able to store and persist data for a long period of time. The other cool part about this, and, and a dialogue that is relatively new, um, how many here have dealt with enterprises that have talked about cyber insurance? That's a big one, right? Now, they have the ability to tell their insurance companies, not only have I stored data immutably, not only do I have six copies, but those copies are not on the same functional network. It's the equivalent of nearly air gapping something. As a matter of fact, the only way you're gonna get to all of those copies is if you know every minor ID that was associated with storing that particular piece of data. And now you start talking about reducing an enterprise's cost liability, that is huge, right? These are all areas where you can make an impact as a provider. And through collaboration, teams will stumble onto all of these different use cases and be able to participate and actively contribute. Scientific archive is another one. We've already talked about seismic data. You know uh, an average flight recorder will generate roughly one terabyte of data per flight? Anybody wanna guess how many flights there are daily? I, and I want you to think about that number because even at 1,000 you're talking a petabyte. Now, I live in Atlanta. 
busiest airport in the world, they have thousands of flights daily, and that's just one city. So as you start looking at all the different use cases, specifically even within some of these, what we call verticals, so they're almost like sub-verticals, right? Climate research data, we are now dealing with, we're, we're talking now with two universities are looking to store climate data, uh, another private enterprise that does climatology research, autonomous driving data, there's the flight data, the seismic data, and we even give examples here, the boxy vehicles data set, AV speech, Google open images, Udacity, self-driving uh, car data, that's already on Filecoin. You can actually look at it, verify it, and download it directly from Slingshot. So feel free to take advantage to, to poke around. I know Stu put that link up there for us. Uh, actually, there's another link there on the bottom. Great to go see what people are storing uh, on the network. And that whole verifiable thing's really important, right? If I'm a researcher and I store data, I want to know that whoever downloads it is going to get what I stored. We talked about retention, but this is just a sample of one piddly university in Queensland, right? Look at those duration numbers, five years, 15 years, 10 years. For anybody that has ever done on-prem enterprise storage, you're looking at a lift and shift every three to five years. Ease their pain, folks, ease their pain. They don't have to go through this. There is no migration, there is no planning. We can store it on the network, forget it, and know that when we ask for it, we're gonna get it back. And what we get back is what we stored. Media, we've already kind of touched on this a little bit, but it's huge, it's huge. Transcoding is another big one that generates a lot of different data. Anybody here familiar with transcoding? I'll take movies and I can store them in 15 different formats and guess what, I've got to store all of them, right? Every single one. How many Disney movies have been made and how many different edits of these Disney movies have been made for different countries, different cultures, different languages, all of this stuff that all has to persist somewhere in space. Media and entertainment is literally a gold mine for people that work in storage. Very, very big. NFTs in the metaverse, that's a hot one, right? It allows you to relate to all the 15, 16, 18 year olds that are out there that wanna store pictures of their cats, right? You can store it on dad's home computer, he's got Filecoin, don't worry about it. But these are all great things, and they're all opportunities. NFT.storage is live and well, Web3 storage is live and well. I think I might even have pictures of Rob's dog. I love Facebook, by the way. I know Stu's already featured this use case, it's one of my favorites, right? Uh, I think it's very important and there's a few things that he mentions, right? It's that continuous record to show that files are secure and have not been tampered with. You can view the archive and check its provenance using immutable information, including a timestamp, image storage data, and last but not least, very important, verified edit history. That's what this is all about. Data is manipulated to meet certain criteria or certain narratives all the time, we wanna make sure that we keep the story straight. The impact of NFTs, there is so much money in this space. Most valuable NFT, $91.8 million. Now if I spend $91.8 million, it will not be on an NFT, I can assure you, but it's still a very popular use case. And guess what, those assets need to be protected, right? 41 billion in crypto was spent on NFTs last year. 41 billion. NFT trading volume rose by 704% between Q2 and Q3 of last year, and that's made a quarter of a million people trade NFTs each month on OpenSea. So for anybody who's browsed OpenSea and needed a good chuckle, they have NFTs for everything. As a matter of fact, there was an actual pro uh, property purchase that was done by NFT on the deed in St. Petersburg, Florida. You are now seeing real world applications of this. These all scream opportunity. Analytics AI, so for those of you that saw some of the footage from South by Southwest, we had a gentleman from Seed AI, Mr. Austin Carson, who spoke, and he really talked about how Filecoin is important for the AI community. We've already mentioned the idea of having data like seismic data, legacy data sets that we can go back and operate on over time, over and over again as, as algorithms evolve. AI is no different. We wanna be able to store prominent data sets and as AI algorithms evolve and improve, we wanna be able to reoperate on those data sets. But we also have to do a few things. Not only do we archive them and ensure that their integrity is intact, 
but we have to be able to detect anomalies in, in data set changes. And it gives us a record that we can audit from the blockchain. But one of the cool things is, as we generate new sets, we also need to be able to index them against previous. We have that capability. And as this network grows and the tool sets grow, these things will get better and better and better. <coughs> The opportunities exist, and one of the things that really struck me about this was really the last sentence, right? And at the end of the last sentence, they talk about a talent shortage. When I decided to really make storage a career roughly a decade ago, and for those of you in the room that are paying attention, yes, I'm dating myself, but bear in mind that even 10, 15 years ago, they were talking about having a significant shortage in storage talent enterprises would need nearly double what they thought would be out there in the world working in this space. Be that cloud, fill that gap, because it's coming. By 2025, they expect there to be roughly 50% of the required talent out there and available. At my previous stop, we were working with a, with a customer and they had a NAS device, a simple NAS device. The administrator was paid 70K a year and another company tried to poach him. They had to pay him an extra 40 to 50K to keep him, just because he knew how to run, run storage array. If you can fill that gap at the price points we are talking, you are changing storage for the better across the globe. But this talent shortage is very real, and this is an opportunity to make up for it, right? To protect and preserve that data, and you will supply that response those economic opportunities exist.